All right. Grab your Bibles. Turn me to Leviticus chapter four. Uh, we are we are studying this book in Leviticus, as I've mentioned in the past several sermons. It zooms in on one central question. It's trying to answer a question: How can one enter and dwell in the presence of the Holy God? And thus far, as we've seen Leviticus in the first three chapters, the answer is through offerings. Offerings. And all offerings are is they're a sacrifice. Uh, they're mostly an animal sacrifice, so it requires a certain blood sacrifice. But there's also the grain offerings, which is an offering of just grain, of your crop, of your first fruits. And what we see with these offerings is that in all these offerings, and tonight we're going to cover the sin offering, in all these offerings, they are they overlap a lot in the rituals, don't they? Um, and so I, I want us to understand that, right? There, there's the different offerings, but within each offering, there's procedures and a ritual involved, and some of these rituals can overlap. There, we see similar rituals happening in each one, right? But each one of these offerings, they do represent a different aspect of Israel of Israel's relationship with God. And so we've been covering here the five major offerings being talked about here in the first six chapters. Uh, we covered, the, we just finished covering the voluntary offerings, right? That's the burnt offering, uh, the grain offering, the peace offering. The burnt offering being the holistic one. The burnt offering is the most important offering. It's the one that encapsulates the relationship that one has with God. And so that's why it requires a male animal sacrifice. Uh, and, and, and you burn the entire carcass. You leave none of it behind. No one eats it. You don't talk to anyone. Everything is sacrificed before the Lord. It encapsulates the entire, your holistic relationship with God. Then there's the grain offering, which is a tribute, a remembrance of the blessings that God has, has given to Israel. Right? It's, it's a rep, it represents thanksgiving, stewardship, and devotion. And then the peace offering is fellowship. Right, a Thanksgiving meal that brings together the community of God. And these three offerings are voluntary. They can be offered at any time by anyone. Um, and so we see here that these are voluntary offerings. Voluntary offerings. The next two offerings that we're going to cover here in Leviticus, they're not voluntary. They are called the expiatory offerings because they are required in a sense that when you realize your own sins, when you feel guilty, when you feel that burden of guilt, you need to bring this offering before God in order to alleviate your guilt. When we say require, keep in mind that these offerings, the sin offering and the guilt offering that we'll cover next time, they're not required in the sense that God needs these sacrifices. These offerings are required in the sense that Israel needed these sacrifices to remain close to God. Keep that in mind. That's what separates Israel and all the rituals here given here by God from all the other pagan religions around them. It's not that God needs them, needs, needs these sacrifices. It's that the human, Israel, needs these offerings. And tonight we'll cover the sin offerings. And again, we'll see some overlapping rituals. We'll see animal sacrifice. We'll see the sprinkling of blood. We'll see the burning of the carcass. And so we're going to be talking about this. And I, I do want to present up front. To so you guys thinking, because sometimes we get so entrapped into like what's going on with this stuff, the details. I want us to think right now for us as a church with these offerings, with the sin offerings specifically. The question that we want to ask ourselves is, is how do you then, how do you deal with the guilt of your life? How do you deal with the sinfulness of your life? Right, we're, even, even if we say we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe in the cross, we believe His blood washes away our sins, we know the very next second we can fall. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with the fact that oftentimes we seem to have to always recommit ourselves to God, refocus our devotion, rededicate our lives, but then there's always a time when we feel like, man, we're just not walking closely with Him. How do you deal with that guilt? And that's the question I, I, I want to lead us towards answering as we're studying through this passage. Again, it's a long passage. I'm not going to read through everything. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys the structure of what's going on here. The structure of the passage that's being laid out. And the first thing we're going to see here, the first thing we're going to see here with the sin offerings are that they are talking about inadvertent sins. Meaning these are sins done unintentionally. Some sins done perhaps by mistake or accidentally. 
that's what chapter 4 is deal with, right? The entire Leviticus chapter 4 deals with inadvertent sins. The instructions here, it begins here in verse 1. It says, speak, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses. So we see here, this, here, this is like, um, this is like a, a transition point in the passage. We notice that this offer here is now different from the first three. Because in, in the first three chapters, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses only happens in chapter 1. Now again, it says here, and the Lord spoke to Moses. So there's something different that's happening. There's a different kind of offering. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, if anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done, or does any one of them, and then so on. And he'll, he'll then go on and talking about these sin offerings. So here we see here that we're dealing with sins, unintentional sins, inadvertent sins. And the rest of chapter 4 deals then with different people who have committed these sins. And that's how they're organized. The first... The first, 21, uh, the first 21 verses deals with the sins, the guilt of the congregation. The guilt of the congregation. Verse 3 to 12, uh, read, read verse 3, it says, If it is the anointed priest who sins. So now we're, so specifically it's the priest who sins, right? And the priest is the high priest. What does the priest do? A priest is a mediator. They act as a representative of Israel to God, but they also represent God to Israel. They act as an intermediary, a mediator between Israel and God. If this guy, this, so this is a really important role. If the high priest, if the anointed priest sins, and keep in mind this is an unintentional sin, thus bring guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin uh, that he has commanded, that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. We see here that when the high priest sins, uh -huh. the guilt is not an individual guilt. The guilt here falls upon the congregation. It falls upon the people. Because why? Because the high priest represents Israel. And so the guilt is upon the people. And so we see here that there is something important about about who you are when you commit these sins. If you jump down to verse 13, we see here that now we're dealing with the next category of people. It says in verse 13, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly and they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and they realize their guilt, then they shall bring sin offering. So here now it talks in verse 13, that section, this section talks about the whole congregation of Israel sinning unintentionally. Now, it's not necessarily, it probably doesn't mean the entire Israel, like every single Israel person in Israel is committing the same sin. Sometimes that can be the case, as you saw with the golden calf, everyone participated in that. But in this case, it could, it could mean that all the, tr all the elders of Israel, all the elders of each tribe of Israel who represent each tribe of Israel, Again, there's, a, there's, there's certain representation happening here. All, with all the elders themselves, if they all sin unintentionally. And it was brought before the eyes of the assembly, meaning now we recognize it. Everyone recognizes their sin. That guilt falls upon Israel as a whole. And therefore, they must bring an offering. And then the next two categories in chapter 4 deals with the guilt of the individual. In verse 22, it says, when a leader sins, doing unintentionally any one of all the things that by the commandments of the Lord his God are not to be done and realizes his guilt, or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring the sin offering. And so we see here a leader. Now the leader here, most likely, we don't know what, which, what this leader represents. It's just this very generic word for leader. Most likely what this passage is talking about is talking about political leader, like king of a nation, a governor of a tribe. That's what's most likely being talked about here. And so we're talking here about a ruler, someone who reigns over a, a, a piece of land or, or a tribe in Israel. And so if this person sins, they have specific commandments of how they should offer sin offerings. And then in verse 27, 
It says, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any one of the things that, but the, that by the Lord commandments ought not to be done, and realizes his guilt. So now we're talking about the common people, the commoners, the, the peasants, or however you guys want to call them. Um, us. We, we probably belong in this group, right? If any of the common people been sin intentionally, they too need to bring a sin offering before the Lord. So we see here that this year, the, the categories here, or the way the sin is organized, the way the sin offering is organized, tells us something about the sin offering. Right? Because before, the organization, the first three offerings that we looked at, the burnt, the grain, the peace, was organized by the type of sacrifice you're bringing, right? Whether it's a bull or a lamb or, or, <clears throat> or a bird. Really what that's saying is that anyone can bring this offering and we allow anyone of any financial status, any social status, anyone can bring these kind of offerings to God. And we'll, we'll fit it according to what they can afford. But in this case, the focus here of the sin offering isn't about what animal you bring to sacrifice. The focus here is upon who committed the offense. And that's important. Let me talk real quick about the procedures of these offerings. Because uh, they're, they're, they're pretty similar across the board, which is why I'm not going to read through this whole thing. But there are some differences, and the differences are what we need to make note of. All right. First, let me start with the sin offerings of the individuals. All right. So from verse 22 to the end of the, of the individuals, what they need to do is that they need to bring either a goat or a lamb. Remember, goat or a lamb, that's like the middle tier animal. They need to bring a goat or lamb to the priest. They don't kill this at the, at the altar. Um, and they'll kill it at the altar to burn offerings. So let me quickly show you this. So they'll kill it here, right? In the bronze altar, the, the altar of the burnt offering. They'll bring, they'll, they'll kill that animal there, they'll kill the goat or lamb there, and then they'll take the blood, and they will, uh, the priest will take some of the blood with his fingers, and it will, it says, I'm reading verse 25, and he'll put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour the rest of the blood at the base of the altar of the burnt offering. So everything is happening, here, right here in the courtyard, not inside the tabernacle, right? So it's outside the tabernacle here. That's where everything's being happening. Where everything's happening. Right. So that then, uh, that blood then represents the purification. You're purifying that sin, right? Then the fat then is removed, right? And remember from the peace offering, the fat belongs to the Lord. The fat is removed, and it is burned. It is burned at the altar. It's the same altar. Uh, verse 26, like the fat of the sacrifice of the peace offering. So here, the fat is burned, representing that the Lord has accepted the sin offering. And the rest, of, the rest of the flesh, the carcass, right? The carcass, what do they do with it? Well, we find out actually later on in chapter 6, Leviticus chapter 6, 26, that the rest of the flesh is actually given to the priest to eat. And again, another symbol that the Lord, the priest who represents God in this case, is accepting the offering from from the people, from the individuals. So that's the individual offering, right? The ruler and the common people. The sin offerings for the congregation have important differences that we need to make note of. All right. First, if we go back, in verse 3. It says in verse 3 that the high priest, if they committed an if they committed sin unintentionally, they realize it, they're bringing a sin offering. What the, the animal they need to bring is a bull. A bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord. And the same thing for the congregational. They need to bring a bull. Verse 11. They should offer a bull from the herd for a sin offering. A bull is more expensive than a lamb or a goat. A bull is more important in that sense. It tells us that the sins of the high priest or the sins of the elders of Israel matter more. They matter more because they represent all of Israel. And therefore a bull must be brought to be killed. The blood then, the, what happens here is they kill the bull, and now the priest will take the blood, and they won't spread the blood at the, at the outside altar. They actually bring the blood inside the tabernacle. Again, this is significant. They're bringing the blood inside the tabernacle, and they're spreading it across the tabernacle. They're, they're sprinkling it upon the veil, on the altar incense, and, and they're... And they're, they're doing everything there because, this, again, this, the role matters. This is the high priest. This is Israel. This is about God and his people. 
there is a contamination in the relationship between God and His people. Not only do the people need to be purified, but now there needs to be some kind of purification, some kind of acceptance happening inside the tabernacle where the God's presence dwells. And so in order for Israel to know that they were accepted again to God, the high priest needs to enter in with this blood sacrifice and come in and it, it, it shows us there that that there's that God again He accepts this. He now allows the high priest to enter in with the sacrifice and be able to purify the holy place of God, and so that the relationship of God, the relationship that God has with His people, is again pure and holy. Then the rest of the flesh, right? So after they take the blood, the rest of the flesh then. It says here, let me see, read with me in verse 11. Uh, so they'll do the same thing with the fat. They'll burn the fat again. But in verse 11, it says, The skin of the bull and all its flesh with its head, its legs, its, its entrails, and its dung, <laughs> its, its poo, uh, and all the rest of the bull, he shall carry it outside the camp to a clean place to the ash heap, and shall burn it up on the firewood on the ash on the ash heap. It shall be burned up. So we're seeing here that it's being taken outside of the courtyard, outside of the camp of Israel, to this place outside of Israel, and the rest of it is being burned out there. Why? It's so it's because the animal, the sin is so grievous that. We don't want any of it to contaminate the rest of Israel. This here represents sin being eradicated from Israel. So that Israel can be pure and holy. It's, it's showing us here that sin is being taken out from the presence of the Lord, out of the presence of Israel, and is being completely erased. Now, as we think about this, I think again, this is sin offering. All right, sin offering, we're, you're dealing with guilt. Right. Remember my question being, how do you deal with guilt in your life before God? A lot of times we deal with it internally. We wrestle it in our own rooms, in private, in the dark. Look here how God caused the people of Israel to deal with their guilt. It's in public. This here is a public demonstration of confession but more importantly, it's a public demonstration of God's forgiveness to His people. It's more, it's, read, read verse 20 with me. In verse 20, it says that, it's dealing with the congregational uh, guilt, uh, He sat, made the sacrifice, so as He did with the bull of the sin offering, so shall He do this. The priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. And that is the sweetest words we can hear if we're wrestling with the burdens of guilt of sin in our lives. That you shall be forgiven. And that's important. It's important for us to know that when, when it's important for Israel to know when, that when they bring this offering and they obey the commandments of the Lord, they shall be forgiven. There are a few things that we learn about sin. Through this, through this account, through this sin offering. The first thing that we learn here is that all sins matter to God. Again, we're in chapter four, the biggest chapter four. We're dealing with inadvertent sins. We're dealing with sins that are done unintentionally by accident. These are the sins we call these sins the "I didn't mean it" sin, right? You you do something, and you're like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that," right? I mean, how many times? Have you excused yourself of these kind of sins? How many times have you overlooked these kinds of transgressions? Maybe you said something and it hurt someone. You didn't mean to. You, you, you hurt a friend or a parent. You, you did something small and it offended them in some way. And, and you say, look, I, I didn't mean to. And it's, it was, I, I did, I, that was, it was all by accident. And sure. I understand you most likely didn't mean to. Yes, it is the intention that matters. But sin is sin. In other words, don't cling to the notion that intentionality trumps an action. 
sin, the sin itself, the action itself, the words that are said, the thoughts that are being thought of, that itself matters as well. God cares. God demands a holy perfection to his law. I mean, and think about it. He spends an entire chapter, all, what is, how, many chapter, how many verses is it? 35 verses, dealing with inadvertent sins. He cares about this. Every sin matters, no matter how big or small. Don't mess around, then. Don't mess around with sin. Don't mess around with your own fallenness, the sinful nature, the, 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 the different things that, that, you, that you wrestle with. Uh, we, we, sometimes we treat like small sins in our life. That, you know, these sins that we were like, you know, everyone does this. Oh, you know, I'm not perfect. I can't do it. Uh, and we, we, sometimes we treat sins like that. Like it's, just a, like, a, like it's just a stain on our shirt. It can be washed. It's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. It's no big deal. There's a book. There's a book called Respectful Sins, written by Jerry Bridges. And he really just talks about all these different sins that our society, our culture, has minimized its seriousness. I'm not going to go through everything that's, that's mentioned in the book. But I recommend it to you guys if you guys are wrestling with different parts, different sins. But think, think about a few, let me give you guys a few examples. Do you wrestle with anxiety or frustration? Those are sin issues. Do you wrestle with anxiety and frustration? Do you have a lack of self-control in your life? Are you impatient? Do you find yourself being impatient? Are you wrestling with anger or bitterness? Or are you just being... Are you wrestling with content? Usually what that means is you're being unthankful. You're being unthankful before God. These are all sin issues. And yes, they may be small. Yes, they may not hurt the people around you. But they, are, they matter before God. And God cares. They matter because all sins defile the human soul. Which is the next thing we learn about sin here. All sin defiles the human soul. Our actions matter more than we think. Because a sin is never just an action. Right? When we think about the sin offering, that this whole process shows us that sin, even inadvertent sin, unintentional sin, is more than just simply finding that kind of, hey, I understand, it was by accident, I, I forgive you, we'll just let it go, let the past be past. It's more than that. We see here that the sin offering tells us that we need to be purified. Because of our sins. Even small, inadvertent sins defile our soul. When you sin, it's not just about reconciling that sin itself, but that sin stems from a sinful heart. And like a cancer, it will contaminate your mind, your will, your words, your actions, your thoughts, your emotions, your souls. No sin. Even though we're dealing with inadvertence in here, no sin is truly 100% unintentional. For instance, if you blow up on someone in anger, and yes, that happens, and things can trigger it, and, and you can't really control it, right? You didn't mean to yell at the person. You didn't mean to yell at your friend or your mom. It, it, it's just things happen. And, and yeah, understand, right? Anger can, be, can just come out just like that. But even if it's inadvertent, even if it's unintentional, that anger stems from a deep-rooted heart issue, deep down. Perhaps you're stressed and you haven't been spending time thanking God for His many blessings. Perhaps you've been hurt by that person in the past and there's some trigger words that, that just happened. You never reconciled that, those hurts. You, you held on to that resentment. You held on to that bitterness. We have to recognize that even our unintentional sins, something is, is showing us that something is wrong with us on the inside. Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 7, verse 20, he says that what defiles a person comes from the inside. Right? What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. And that's what defiles a person. 
take every sin seriously. Meaning, what that really means is take your life seriously before God. Take your life seriously before God. Take captive everything that goes around, goes about inside you. Every angry thought, every bout of, of frustration, every glance at, at an immoral image, every speck of discontentment. Take hold of all those things. They matter because they impact who you are. They defile you if you don't. Now, you know, oftentimes we, we, critic, we criticize legalism, which I agree with. We should not promote legalism, right? We, don't, we want to avoid holding on to a work-based righteousness. So I'm not, I'm not talking about that, right? Our righteousness is not our own. It's from Christ alone, right? It's His righteousness. But that doesn't mean we can't, that doesn't mean we, we can ignore our sins then. Even though our righteousness is not our own, even though it's from Christ, and He gave that to us as a gift, it doesn't mean we can, we can ignore our sins. Even the smallest sins serve as a reminder to us that we need to be cleansed, that we are not perfect, that we need Christ. Every single moment of our life, Christ what it all does, what all, what all this shows us, what all this does to us, what all this teaches us, is it points us to our need for Jesus. And then we see here that all sins impact those around you, especially for leaders. I mean, there's a reason why God singles out the high priests, the elders of each tribe, why he singles out a ruler of a nation for their inadvertent sins. Because when a, when a leader falls into sin, his radius of impact is much greater. That's why when we see our heroes fall, right, and think about our heroes, not just Christian heroes, Christian pastors, but just sports heroes, other people we look up to, other people we idolize. When our heroes fall into immorality, it shakes us. It makes us question, like, why are we following this person? It shakes our faith, it undermines our beliefs, it makes us start wondering, questioning ourselves. Am I following the right people? Am I listening to the right teaching? Could I be in the wrong? And this is why when it comes to leadership, when it comes to the spiritual leadership within the church, comes to spiritual leadership within this fellowship, what matters is not about ability. What matters is about character. Character trumps ability. And when I talk about character, I don't mean that you have to be perfect. I don't mean that you have to be sinless, because again, this passage here shows that nobody is sinless, right? You're not to be perfect in morality. It is whether or not, if you have good character, it's whether or not you own up to your sinfulness and truly lean upon the grace of God. Whether or not you own up to it. I mean, again, look at these sacrifices. The, the point of performing these sacrifices, right? If you're bringing a sin sacrifice... You're, yes, you're, there's, there's certain shame to it. It's public. People can see you. You're preparing the sacrifice. You're confessing your sins publicly as you're laying your hand upon the head of the animal. The priest knows what's going on. They're killing out for you. It's public. People see it. But the point of it is, is not like, hey, look at that person. He did something. The point of these sacrifices is that you are willing to own up to your mistakes. You're willing to own up to it. And you recognize it. You recognize your own guilt and you say, you know what, I am wrong. Let me atone for that. Let me seek forgiveness for that. And I, and I'll, I'll admit, that's difficult. That's difficult for all of us. Think about, think about for, even for yourselves. It can be easy to confess sins to God in private. But isn't it hard to share your sins for accountability in your own small group, with your own peers, with the people who, with the church, with pastors, with mentors, with disciples. Isn't it hard to do so? I want us to think about this. I want to think about, I want to think about this because I, I think it's necessary for us to own up to our sins. Not so that we can just spill out our sins and our shoulders everywhere, but so that we can come to a realization that we need Christ. And we need Christ and His body, His grace, His blessings, His word. We need Him in our lives more and more so. 
You see, if you call yourself a believer, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, do you then own up to your own sins? Are you willing to admit your own fault? Do you seek retribution, not by your own works, but by the grace and mercy of your God? You see, that's what matters when we come even before other people. I mean, yes, when we think about scripture, when we think about leadership, it does matter more when the high priest sins, just like today it matters more when a pastor sins. But that doesn't take away how you need to also understand your sin and your how your sins impact those around you. In First Peter, First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two, it says that if, you, if you're a believer, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God calls you a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And, and so what does God then here do? Well, how does that work? How do you proclaim the excellencies of your God? Verse 11, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Peter writes, Beloved, I urge you as soldiers and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Meaning, cleanse yourself of sin. Watch your life. Watch every portion of your life. Your life matters. Your sins matter. Abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Don't let it contaminate your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that why? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. It's no small thing to be a Christian in this world. Even more so today as the culture speaks out against the church as evildoers. If you say you go to church, how much more then do you need to lean upon God's grace in your life? To own up to your sins, to admit your weaknesses, and say, I know, you, I know you're watching me. I know, I, I, you know, I know that you know I'm a Christian, but it's not about me. Let me show you my Savior, where my righteousness lies in Christ. Watch then your own life and bring everything, all your sins before God to the cross. Going back to Leviticus, we cover chapter 4 here. And I want to talk about chapter, chapter 5, verse 1 to 13, which also deals with sin offerings. And here, the passage again kind of changes. And now we're talking here, we're dealing here now with a different kind of sin. A sin of omission. Sin of omission. Right, we're still dealing with sin offerings, but the structure changes. So the focus here changes. Right, the focus here is not upon necessarily not upon the sinner anymore, but upon the sin itself. Again, let me go through the structure real quick. Oops. The structure here um, in Leviticus chapter 5. It talks about here. Uh, first, we see here that it, it gives you different kinds of sins. I'll, I'll, touch, I'll touch upon those. In verses 1 through 4, it talks about different kinds of sins that are sins of omission. But when he, in verse 5, it says, When he realizes his guilt in any of these sins, and confesses the sins he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord with his sin offering. And he goes through the different kinds of sin offerings that you can bring. You can bring a lamb or a goat, or you can bring a turtle dove or pigeon. Or in verse 11, he can bring a temple and an FF of, fly, of fine flour, so you can bring a grain for this offering. All right, so we're talking here again, it's being organized by different types of things you can bring for this offering. Why? What's the point here? The point is that the focus is not upon who the sinner is. The focus is not upon what, the focus is more upon what sins are we dealing with. And what sins are we dealing with is found here in verse 1 through 4 of chapter 5. And the first one that we see here is the sin of omission. Just in verse 1, if anyone sins in that he hears a public adjuration to testify, and though he is a witness, whether he has seen or come to know the matter, yet does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. What's going on here is that this person is withhold, withholding evidence. He, he's an eyewitness of a crime, and he doesn't speak up. The idea here is that someone who remains silent Someone here who remains silent, someone here, 
you'll be, well, they'll, they'll begin to feel the guilt. They begin to feel that burden, right? They'll they'll bear that burden. And so that and so what you need to do is when you feel that guilt, then when you feel that that burden to bear, what you need to do is you need to bring sin offering because you realize you've done something wrong. Why is this a sin of omission? What is a sin of omission? It's not that they are done inadvertently, nor are they done intentionally. They are, these are sins that are committed because a person neglected to do the right thing. And in this case, the right thing to do was to speak up against the crime, against the injustice. When you neglect to do the right thing, you are actually in sin. And when you realize that, you feel guilty about it, God says, bring a sin offering. The second example he has here, it's, it's those who become and stay unclean. So in verse 2, if anyone touches an unclean thing, whether a carcass of an unclean wild animal or, unclean, or a carcass of an unclean livestock or a carcass of an unclean swarming thing, and it's hidden from him, and he has become unclean, and he realizes guilt, or, verse 3, if he touches human uncleanness, of whether sort of uncleanness may be with which one becomes unclean, and is hidden from him, and when he comes to know it, realizes his guilt, so when he does that, he needs to bring a sin offering. Now, we'll talk more about cleanliness, unclean, and clean things when we reach that portion of Leviticus to provide more details of what exactly is clean and unclean. But the point here is, the reason why this is a sin of omission is most likely what's happening is that this person touched something that's unclean and neglected to purify himself right away. So he stayed unclean for a long time. And when he realizes it, that guilt weighs on him. That guilt weighs on him because he didn't purify himself. And so he needs, when he feels that guilt, he needs to bring a sin offering. Again, we'll deal more about what does it mean to be clean and unclean later. And then the final sin of omission that we see here are those who make rash promises and fail to keep it. Verse 4. If anyone utters with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good, any sort of rash oath that people swear and is hidden from him, when he comes to know it and realize his guilt in any of these, and so on, he needs to bring guilt offering. So a rash oath, the, what it's talking about here is you're making rash promises. You're saying things quickly, but you're failing to keep them. You're failing to keep them. And when they realize they didn't fulfill their promise, they were to present a sin offering because they feel guilty. In all these cases, in all three of these cases, we're dealing with a neglect to do what is right. Whether it's to fulfill an oath, whether it's to purify yourself, or whether it's to speak up against the wrong. And over time, that guilt, that guilt weighs upon them, and they realize their sinfulness before God, and God says, here's a way out. Bring a sin offering. What do we learn about sin with these with these omissions, uh, sins of omission. We learn that sin, all sins oppose doing what is right. Right? When we talk about sin, it's not just about doing something that's wrong. Alright? It's not just about that. Sin includes neglecting to do what is right. Sin opposes what is right. I want us to think about this. Think about these sins of omission. Especially the first and third one. Again, we'll talk about cleanliness later. Let me first talk about the sin of failing to uphold your promises. We know in the New Testament, James writes to us in the book of James, let your yes be yes and your no's be no. We know, we heard this a lot before, right? We need to stay true to our word. And perhaps we know this so well that this is probably why many of us can get scared of making commitment to something. Or we're scared of making commitment and failing to uphold it. But the point here is not whether or not you can make these promises. The point here about your yes be yes, your no's be no's, is whether or not you commit yourself to doing what is right. Because when you come to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what you're doing is you're making your first commitment. Your first commitment is to the Lord. Are you then going to do, live your life according then to God's word? But let me give you some more basic examples. For instance, one commitment that we constantly tell ourselves what we're going to do is we'll read the Bible every day. Do you keep that promise when you say that? 
you keep that commitment. You can pray all day. Or I'm going to, I'm going to, I need, I need to do more better to build this relationship with this unbeliever or with this family member. Do you keep those promises? Do you let your yes be yes and your no's be no's? Or let me give you just some more other things. Some things that are not necessarily, not necessarily like things we need to do in terms of obedience of scripture, but things that are wise to do. Things that we recognize that these are the right things to do. When you say that you know you should sleep earlier, do you keep that promise? That this is the last video I'm going to watch. That I really need to stop procrastinating. Do you follow up with your words when you say these things? Or are you just saying them? These are certain kinds of things that we need to recognize. That there are certain some things, there are some things that are wise and right to do. And yet, we fail to do so. And that, that's no small thing. That's something we need to recognize of a sin issue in our own hearts. And the sin omission about speaking truth. You see, we are called to speak truth about others, even if that truth judges their actions. And so, if you're in your small group, and you hear for the tenth time how your friend, your brother or sister, needs to manage their time better, what do you say when you hear that? Are you willing to call out your friends? Because that's what, is, that's what accountability means. Are you willing to speak truth into your lives? Or are you willing to stand up for those who are being bullied? When you hear people talking, gossiping behind another person's back, and you're part of that conversation, do you stop it? Uh, do, do you, or do you, do you try your best to turn the conversation in a different direction? When, when I'm saying you need to speak truth about others, you need to present these truths about other people and what they wrestle with, I'm not telling you to be a whistleblower. I'm what I'm telling you is I'm telling you to be a man or woman of God. One who fears the Lord more than man. One who recognizes wrong and will not just speak out against it, but will seek to help reconcile and encourage others who are stuck in their sins. You do it out of love. And no, when we talk about these sins of omission, yes, we're not perfect. And that's why these sacrifices exist. Because when we fail to do these things and we feel guilty about it, there's an offering for that. God recognizes that you are indeed imperfect as well. He knows that we need to atone for our guilt. He realized just, when we realize how sinful we are, how weak we are, how imperfect and broken we are, we need some way to approach God again and seek His help. Which leads us to our last point here. That all sins require confession and repentance. When a person realizes his guilt, they are to confess their sins and bring the sin offering to the Lord. That's, what, that's pretty much what the sin offering is. When you recognize your guilt for a sin you committed, no matter how big or small, bring the sin offering. But one thing that they do here, you look at me in chapter 5, Leviticus chapter 5. In verse 5, he says, when he realizes his guilt, so he, he's made aware, this is a, something wrong that he's done. When he realizes his guilt in any of this, in any of these, and confesses the sin he has committed. So here's an act of confession. He recognizes what was wrong, and he confessed it. He spoke out. You see, how do you deal with your weight of guilt from your sins? The act of confessing is the way God wants us to alleviate our guilt. He wants us to confess. You see, guilt is such a heavy burden to bear, right? It weighs upon the soul. It's like these heavy ankle weights that drags you down. Confession, then, is freedom. It's freedom. Confession admits your wrongs. But more than that, confession admits that you need help. That God's grace is more than enough. That though your sins are many, God's mercy is more. Confession is more than just a mere general blanket statement. It's specific. You're recognizing your guilt and your sins. You're confessing that you're making an honest assessment about your spiritual state. But unlike Israel, 
who needed the sin offerings to know that they've been accepted and forgiven by God, we have something greater. We have Jesus Christ, who is greater than all the blood of the bulls and lambs that were killed at the altar, because Jesus did something that the blood of bulls and goats can never do. Jesus' blood purifies our souls for eternity. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 tells us that when every priest stands daily at the service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, right? Every day, same sacrifices, more bulls, more goats, more lambs. These same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice, his perfect, unblemished body, his blood for sins, what did he do? He sat down the right hand of God. Why? Because he's finished. He's finished. He sat down and he's waiting from, from that time until his enemies be made a footstool under his feet. He defeated sin for all time. No other sacrifice needed. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. We have in Christ an unhindered, unlimited access to God's throne. It's the fact that Jesus' sacrifice atones for our sin. That's why we can truly confess our sins and walk with God. Turn with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, tells us, us, us how we fellowship with God. Here, we see how everything we've been talking about, from, from the sins of omission to inadvertent sins, how all this ties together to the fact that we need to confess our sins before God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 says, and we say we have fellowship with Him, with God, while we walk in darkness. What do we do? We lie and do not practice the truth. We have broken our oath. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from, from what sin? From all sins. All sins, inadvertent sins, intentional sins, sins of omission, all sins are cleansed by the blood of Christ. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But here's the key, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess our sins. This is why we can have confidence to approach the throne of God and ask for, ask for His grace. This is why we can share in our small groups and that we are sinners and we need accountability. This is why we can humbly share with unbelievers that Jesus is better and why they should come to know Him. Because we recognize that we can bring everything, our burdens, our guilt, our sins to Christ. Jesus is better. So, if today you are wrestling with something in your own heart, a burden of guilt, I want to encourage you that the way to God is open because of the blood of Christ. We don't need to bring no more goats, no more bulls. We have Jesus who made the way possible for us. And if you are here and you have never approached the cross of Christ, you've or you, you realize perhaps you haven't been walking the, the, right, the righteous path, or you're, you're here and you're, you're learning about Christianity, and you're an unbeliever, you're seeking, you're wondering how can you atone for your guilt. If you have not approached the cross of Christ and confessed your sins before Him, I want to advise you to do so now, tonight. Jesus died so that through Him you can come to know God. Jesus died so that you can find peace with your wrestling. Jesus died so that you can be cleansed from the guilt that stains your soul. So the big idea is this. Confess your sins before God and find forgiveness that was brought by the blood of Christ. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you, God, for sending us your Son, Jesus Christ. 
I thank you, Lord, for Jesus' death, who died on the cross for our sins, who made a way possible to you. For by his single offering, all sins, all of our sins are forgiven. Lord, and let us then approach your throne of grace boldly, with such confidence, knowing that when we confess our sins before you, we will be forgiven. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here in this room who's wrestling with guilt, or anyone here who does not know you, someone here who just seeking for peace, a calm in the midst of their frustration and, and anger, or perhaps they're just looking for joy, for contentment. I pray, Lord, that they will find, they will find their rest in Christ alone. Lord, may your spirit move in our hearts. And may you draw us then near to you. And may we just see just how, see and taste just how beautiful, how great, how merciful, how good you truly are. Lord, thank you for loving us so much that you will send your own beloved son to die on the cross for our sins. You're indeed an amazing and wonderful God. Pray all this in your name.